for the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase. It's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. This is going to be a really, really fun one. We love doing these deep dives, and we're going to talk a little Machiavelli today. And no, I'm not talking about my favorite Tupac album. Uh, the guy, the myth, the legend, believe it or not, influence on a whole lot of people, including founding fathers, including people today. You're going to be shocked. We're going to go to our friend Amanda Griffiths has returned to the program. Last time we had her on, she mentioned this, and I was like, ooh, I want to do that one. Now we get to do it. I'm thrilled you're here. Thank you so much for joining us for this one. This is honestly a dream come true, Andrew. This is, I think I've peaked and it's just downhill from here. So we're going to enjoy it. Now, if we could get movie rights to it, that would be peak because then you get paid for it. But this is going to be fun, I think. Um, of course, you've known Amanda. She's been on the program before. Uh, University of Chicago. You know, if you got to go to school in the Midwest, not a bad spot. Uh, Cato Institute, long list of accolades and accomplishments. But this is kind of your baby, isn't it? You love. In fact, last time you were on the show, you were wearing a Machiavelli shirt. I um, yeah, I got another one too. I have, but I think I have three Machiavelli shirts. Here's a, it's a Machiavelli quote shirt from Chapter 18 of the Prince, it's the Fox Lion quote. Uh, well, for the podcast so. folks, though, give them the quote real quick, just in case they're not watching. So yeah, in in English, um, <clears throat> the lion cannot protect himself from uh, from traps, and the fox cannot defend himself from wolves. One must therefore be a uh, a fox to recognize traps, uh, avoid traps, and a lion to frighten wolves. And that's chapter 18 of the Prince. So now got a here's, few here's one of the key things. And this is something you've done a lot of research on before we even go into the myths and the legends and all that. And we're going to get into all that. There's an old joke in poetry and I'm not a great poet, but I had to, you know, you got to take humanities when you go to school, even community college kids like me. There's the old joke of like, where does the poet stop and the translator start? Right. Yeah. You've done quite a bit of research on this. The translations matter a lot, especially mm -hmm. something that's controversial, especially something where he kind of had an interesting writing and speaking style where he was kind of talking around things and talked in allegories and talked in metaphors. Talk about the translation element of this, because people don't know, you know, we're dealing with Italian, we're dealing with Latin, we're dealing with the 15th century here. That's a really important piece of this puzzle to have before you even delve into anything, isn't it? It is, and in fact, in, in Italian, they have a they have a saying that goes um, "traduttore traitore," which is translator traitor. Um, that the idea being that you can never quite grasp someone through translation. This was something that you understand intuitively, I think, early on when you're reading someone, and it's the reason that I decided I had to learn Italian. As uh, I started reading Machiavelli very young. And realize I've got to read this guy and the language in which he wrote to really get him because you get that sense as you're reading him you're like this is I'm not getting something there's something here so a lot of my work particularly my early work uh, looks at specific words and phrases that Machiavelli uses that have been translated in, in myriad ways and looks at sort of, okay, how is this word being used back then? How is Machiavelli using it in this given context? And then how have people interpreted this perhaps either in, in a more cursory way or in a way that's not quite holistic uh, with, with respect to 
what he really means, what he's really getting at. And uh, a couple of my earlier papers take a look and do some deep dives on that um, with respect to his views on virtu, with his res uh, virtue, with respect to his views on fortune, fortuna. So that's that's a lot of some of my early work that's then spawned more of my uh, more of my recent work as well. Now we talk about one of our founding principles in our program is things don't happen in a vacuum; they happen in a sequence. Mm -hmm. Boy, is there a lot of cross history right about the time Machiavelli shows up. He's born into Florence, which is, of course, one of the centers of Europe at the time. We know the Renaissance. This is right after uh, the Medici family, which, boy, you could do a whole career's work just on them. Yes. Uh, Savrianola, if you don't know that story, that just went down. There's a lot of stuff going on around the, you know, just this is local news. This isn't even national news for our parlance. This is yeah. stuff happening right in and around him. This is a real crossroads of history that he shows up in, isn't it? Yeah, so I guess giving a little bit of historical context, if we want to give a setting, Machiavelli is born on May 3rd, 1469. And uh, at the time, there's a whole lot of political unrest and unease. The Medici are in and out and in and out of power. And in uh, in the 1490s, you get uh, the really the peak of the Spanish Inquisition. You have, as you mentioned, uh, Savonarola, um, but we'll go back a little bit earlier. When Machiavelli is nine years old, there's something called the Pazzi Conspiracy. Interestingly, Pazzo in Italian means crazy, but it's this attempt to assassinate the, the Medici family. Uh, one assassination attempt is successful, the other fails. And the fallout of the Pazzi Conspiracy, Machiavelli is witnessing all of this as a nine-year-old. And he's witnessing it live. Uh, he's nine years old and there are people being disemboweled in the town square, uh, hung from windows. If anyone has seen Hannibal, uh, the early scene where Hannibal makes a reference to uh, to someone getting hung out of windows, I won't get too graphic, that happened. There is an extremely good chance Monkey really saw that. He at least heard of it and again he's nine years old. So that's his grounding in politics. Then in the 1490s, the Medici are run out. There is this revival of, you know, religious uh, apocalyptic radicalism. This idea of the eminence of redemption being at hand. Is it an eschaton? Is it a renewal? There are fighting factions with respect to that. Um, and then Savonarola is burnt at the stake. Uh, Savonarola is this 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 kind of dissident, religious, radical. He's not a uh, papist, but he is extremely, uh, extremely rabid. And so are his followers. Machiavelli is part of a, a very briefly established new government that's more Republican. He becomes the right-hand man of this guy named Piero Sodrini, who is uh, sort of, is called Gontalmiere, but kind of the leader of Florence. Then the Medici return, Soderini is run out, uh, Machiavelli is put on this list of potential conspirators against the Medici. Uh, we're, we're skipping a lot and we can, we can go back and dive into some things. Machiavelli eventually is put on a list of potential conspirators against the Medici. And an arrest, is, or sorry, a warrant is, is sent out for his arrest. He goes and hides. Then another announcement is made that anyone who knows of his whereabouts and does not share them will share his fate, whatever that may be. At that point, Machiavelli turns himself in. And because he and he's not been conspiring against the Medici, he just doesn't want his friends and his family to have whatever is going to happen to him, which is probably going to be death. He doesn't want that to happen to them. And he is in the um, uh, Barquello, which is a prison for uh, for for almost a month, I believe. He is tortured. Uh, he is interrogated. Finally, he is released uh, mercifully and goes back to, uh, to this kind of little family, uh, 
family hut would, where I've been on the outskirts of, of Florence. It's called Albergaccio, which literally means ugly inn. Um, and that's where he does a lot of his writing. That's where he does a lot of his, his speaking and, and his, his conversations with, with people where he gets his fodder for his most famous works, The Prince and the Discourses. And then he does eventually come back into politics, never enjoys quite the same position that he had with Soderini, but he does attempt to train a civilian militia, which was kind of his pet project. Um, there is another, sadly, there, there's another Republican revival that ousts the Medici family again. Machiavelli, we would think, would be very, very sympathetic to that. But because Machiavelli technically worked for the Medici, he's not trusted. And uh, he dies pretty soon after that on uh, June 21st, 1527. So again, a lot of history, but, there, but there's some of your context. Yeah, and this is all under uh, the Borgia rule, which is an important context. So he's not even the wickedest guy in town by far. He's well, way down the list. The Borgias have been pretty lines, um, perhaps a yeah. little bit unfairly. But yeah, the, he was he worked for the he worked for Cesare Borgia briefly during that little stint when uh, Alexander VI was pope, and then uh, Cesare Borgia was trying to unify the uh, the Romagna area. Yeah, now the Borgias are so good. They've had two disparate and very different uh, TV series already made about them. You can go check them out. Uh, the Overseas Carnival one is far superior, by the way, just my personal accurate right. but humble opinion. Um, mm -hmm. But th there's so much stuff going on here. Here's where we should start, though, because people know about his writing and The Prince, and The Prince is what really made him famous. But nobody read that book the first 20 years it was out. The, this thing was definitely a slow burn. This is where the myth and the legend really starts catching up with the guy because he had success in his, you know, in his own city and city state and the politics of the day. But what we think of as Machiavelli doesn't really start until that book goes international and world leaders at the time, you know, start reading it. The French get a hold of it. Henry VIII was known to be a, a fan of it. Thomas Crawwell, we've got papers where he talks about it. That's where this really starts turning into what we think of as Machiavelli, doesn't it? Yeah, so you brought up a really great point. The English-speaking world, our first introduction to Machiavelli was not through a translation of Machiavelli. Uh, it was through a guy named Innocent Gentillet, who, is, uh, who was a French Protestant and he wrote a book called Contre Machiavel, which is anti-Machiavelli. So imagine like there's this writer or reporter or journalist, whatever, who's written this thing in the Atlantic, but you haven't read it. And I come up to you and I say, hey, have you read this article? And you haven't. And I say, well, let me tell you all about it and why it's wrong and what it says and why it's bad. And that's basically what Jean Thier did. He made Machiavelli this scapegoat for Catholic sacrilege during the Protestant, the English Protestant Reformation, French Protestant Reformation, where obviously the Catholics and the Protestants, not really great friends. Machiavelli again becomes this scapegoat. Jean Thier refers to him uh, as a uh, follower of Epicurus, a, a doctor of atheists and a master of ignorance, which I really want on a business card. Uh, so that sounds kind of cool. But at any rate, there that's how the English-speaking world, world is introduced to him. Before they even read Machiavelli, they read this guy maligning Machiavelli, constructing all of these, you know, kind of paper Machiavellian maxims and knocking them down. So then we come to Machiavelli having this idea, even if we're inclined to be sympathetic to the guy, even if we're inclined to read him in a more nuanced light, there's always already a filter where we've gotten this idea that an argument that ha has been made by Machiavelli that perhaps hasn't really been made, but someone has told us, here's what he means when he says X, here's what Machiavelli thinks. So you're always kind of having to construct an apologia for something that might not have even ever been said or thought or intended. And that's how we kind of get this, that, that's how this myth of Machiavelli is kind of first, first incepted. Yeah, so for those of you that need a flowchart for all this, which I'm one of them, we're not even out of the 15th century yet here. 
And already to get to the core of Machiavelli, we've got to run through this French Huguenot who's a Protestant because he wrote this discourse against Machiavelli or anti-Machiavelli that was published in Geneva in 1576 to understand something that he wrote in the 1520s that wasn't even released until years later about a guy that's already needing to be translated. That's a lot of, that's a lot of filters to try to get to something. And, you know, if you know anything about source documentation and, you know, textual criticism and stuff, man, we're not even 50 years from the guy and you've already got a mess on your hands. Yeah. No, it's like six degrees, but so many more. And, you know, you, you get this, you get this any time that you, that someone, that you're in a class, right? And someone teaches you about someone, you're getting their opinion, their distillation, their filter of them. Um, when I started reading Machiavelli, I was, I didn't, I wasn't doing it for a class the first time that I read Machiavelli. And so no, no, no one ever taught me how to read Machiavelli, which is kind of why I have some heterodox opinions on uh, obviously, I have since taken courses on Machiavelli taught by Machiavelli scholars. But when I first came to him, it was completely raw. It was without any of that, let me tell you what he means. And that really, I think there's kind of a, a, a beauty in that level of ignorance sometimes when you encounter a thinker. And you can only do it once. Um, but yeah, that's that's how you get a lot of the Machiavellian uh, maxims and, and potential halfway translations that might miss the mark or might miss some of the nuance um, is a lot of it starts with with people like Jean Thier. And it's amazing because, and here's where it gets really funny. You just mentioned the thinkers. Boy, you start looking at the list of philosophers, and these are just the ones that mention him by name and quote him and actually do work about him. I mean, this is Bowdoin, Francis Bacon, Algeron Sidney, Harrington, Milton, Spinoza, Rousseau, Hume, Gibbons, Adam Smith. Like, this is a who's who list for the 16th, 17th century philosophers. And they're all dealing with this guy. And they're dealing with him secondhand through a translation. Is it any wonder that this is kind of, beca you know, it's almost urban legend at this point, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and uh, you, it goes down even carries through today. Uh, I have a friend who actually does research on how Machiavelli has influenced various theories of grand strategy and his knowledge on that far outstrips mine. But um, <clears throat> you, every single person who reads Machiavelli kind of has a different Machiavelli, uh, which should be telling in and of itself. You know, even when you're looking at how Machiavelli has influenced grand strategy, well, every one of these grand strategies is different. Everyone has a different idea of what Machiavelli's philosophy of history is. Everyone has a different idea about what Machiavelli thinks about chance or fate or contingency, or what Machiavelli thinks about religion. So that in and of itself, for me, is a huge, I mean, it just makes me really insatiably curious. So who is this guy? Let's read him in the language in which he wrote. Let's get into who he was, where he was, whom he knew, what were these discourses that surrounded him at the time, and how do or don't they emerge in his work, that kind of thing. That's that's what really turns me on about this research. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break. Amanda Griffins is joining us. We're talking Machiavelli. That's the background. That's the mythology. That's the mess that you got to wade into to get to it. So we're going to get to it right after the break. The actual two main works, Discourses on Livy, The Prince, which is the famous one. What does it actually say? Does anybody actually know what it says, even though it's one of the most widely read things ever? Amanda Griff has joined us on Herd Tell. We'll be right back with her right after this. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Uh, 
Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. All right, we're talking conspiracy theories. One of the original conspiracy theories, Machiavelli, because who knows what he wrote? And he wrote two major works, and we still can't determine what he wrote. Uh, Amanda Griffins, break this down for us. Let's start with The Prince, because that's the big one. We went through why the translation's an issue. We went through why culturally there's some issues. Um, the English world especially got really enamored with him. What is The Prince actually about? What was he addressing as an author? And what does it actually say when you read it in context, understanding the time period he wrote it in and in the original language? Sure. That's a fantastic question. And there are so many answers to it. The Prince is doing a lot of things. In one sense, the prince is, as many people know, Machiavelli's attempt to get back into politics. He's writing this, hoping to impress uh, potential future employers. Yes, that's all true. Uh, the Medici family, who are now back in power. He's also writing this for, as he says in his introduction, for whoever understands it. He's writing this, and this is not unique to Machiavelli, he's writing this with an eye toward future generations, toward future leaders. And he's writing this, this especially comes out in the final chapter of The Prince, he's writing this to someone, to anyone, who would be a redeemer, a unifier of the Italian cities, uh, who would redeem Italy from the barbarians that are invading. Uh, and we don't know, those can be from within and from without. So he's writing this, in a sense, in a very immediate context. Yes, he wants to get back into power and say, hey, I've got some really great strategies for you guys. I can help you. I can be a great strategist. He's also writing this to say, this is how you lead. And this is how you as an individual can lead. This is how you as a people can lead. This is how you become a leader. Um, and that is the, the, that's the both immediate and longer term, deeper sense of, of what's going on in, in the prince. Yeah. So one of the big problems here, and apologies to my father here, who's a you know dedicated Greekophile, Part of the problem here is people think this is, you know, Machiavelli got that reputation of, well, it's underhanded tactics and dirty play and this sort of thing. Where a lot of that comes from, though, is because the way he wrote this, it's written on, it's written in allegory, but it's like a how-to manual. This is how you exercise power. So it's very blunt about you have to have, we already talked about he, he was enamored with raising his own civilian militia because he had a hatred for mercenaries, probably from those things he saw as a childhood, hated mercenaries. So he believed in, you know, citizen soldiers or a standing army, and he dedicated himself to that. So those kind of influences are there. But that breaks from the Greek tradition, which was which ideal society are you going to pick and then try to get to the ideal society? He was very blunt about not believing in that. That was very jarring to people, especially the Roman Catholic Church, which came out of the Roman tradition, which was a remix of the Greek tradition. I know that's a lot of deep philosophical stuff to skim over, but that's kind of where the problem starts is. He broke with the thought of the day. He he wasn't so much being underhanded. He was just being blunt. And people took it as, oh, this is underhanded, dirty play because it was just so radical to the way they thought of things. Is that a fair way to put it? Uh, it is. It is. And I think, again, a lot of it is you get these weird kind of wacky, wonky translations. Um, one of them that I know we, we discussed back and forth was people think of him as this guy who says, well, you know, the ends justify the means. And this just, this is kind of, kind of an example of how, it gives you an example of how translations can sometimes be a little bit deceiving. So Machiavelli never literally says the ends justify the means. Uh, what he does say in Italian, and then we'll do English, si guarda al fine. So one looks to the fine end. Now, that's often translated as one judges by the final result, one looks to the outcome, the outcome matters. Fine is an interesting word in Italian. It's exactly like end in English. It has two meanings. It means outcome. Uh, it means the final product of something, but it also means intention. What's your end goal? What's your end game? Italian's more helpful than English in this respect because you can tell oftentimes what end someone means with the gender. So il fi, or a, la fine, the feminine, is the final result, the conclusion, the outcome of something. 
il fine, which is what Machiavelli is using in the contraction, si guarda al, a il fine, often that's, that's the only version of fine that also means intention. Now, it can mean both intention and outcome, but if you just want to say outcome, oftentimes you're going to go with la, you're going to go with feminine, which Machiavelli doesn't use. If you want to say intention, you've got to go with il. So what Machiavelli is doing is he's using the version of fine that has that double meaning. He's using that version of fine that and implicates both intentions and outcomes. So now you've got something where we're not quite sure whether he's saying one looks at the outcome or one looks at the intention. The intention is what matters. My understanding of the guy is he's saying both, that it's not the ends justify the means. You've got to ask which end. And what Machiavelli is telling us is both types of ends matter. You need the right intention and you need to unify that intention with the effectual result. So that's a little bit of a taste of how some of these things get obscure when you just read it in a cursory way. Right. And again, to bring it back to a practical level, though, even though it's paraphrased and a little apocryphal, ends justify the means. Let's be fair here. This is a guy that's working for a Borgia. He was tortured by the Mendices. Like, I, you can kind of see where he's coming from when you're dealing with the sort of stuff he's dealing with, right? The, and, and the point I'm making, and I'm being a little funny about it, though, is like, this is something that everybody thinks and a lot of people believe. He's just saying it out loud. And because of the way the legend got built up, because the best thing that ever happened to the prince was the Catholic Church banned it. Well, of course, <laughs> as soon as they ban it and they put it on the Index Librorium Prohibitorium, which, by the way, is the most awesome thing. If, if I had a dance crew back in the day, that would have been the name. That's awesome. <laughs> but that's the best thing that ever happened to this thing, because once you ban something and once the Catholic Church, which was having its own issues at the time, because, again, Borgias are running the thing. Well, when it, that happens, really too. Yeah. you're just putting a, a spotlight on something and going, oh, well, why don't I want to see that? And then when it's something just so, I mean, that's really, it's icky, it's dirty, it's naughty, it's something you're not supposed to say. Ends justify the mean is also common sense to a lot of people. It's plain spoken thought to a lot of people. It's not like, you know, the discourses where you got to dig in there to get a little sound bite. It's just pump right there. That's the stuff that takes fire word of mouth, and that's how legends get built, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and and again, you know, it's it's one of those things where you're asking which which end because it's it's not as simplistic as well, just the right result. If it gets the job done, then it's fine. And it's also not, you know, having the right intentions is all you need. Neither of those things, I think, is 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 what's is what's being said here. Is what what we're saying is you need to have the right intention. You need to have the right idea of what you want and that you need to actually get it. You can, intentions are not enough. And also just being effective isn't enough to be truly virtuous. You have to have the right intentions and the right outcomes, and you have to unify those. And a lot of what Machiavelli's project is, is figuring out how do you do that? Yeah, talking to Amanda Griffiths. Okay, so this is obviously an important work. It's been a well-worked-over work. Instead of trying to go through the whole book um, in the time we have, I'm going to throw you a couple of the of the legends about what the book is and is, and oh, you boy. tell me whether they're correct or not, okay? Okay. Uh, so here's some of the misconceptions of it. Was it an allegory against the Catholic Church? No. I mean, Machiavelli certainly didn't have, you know, he he, he was not a huge fan of the Catholic Church by any stretch of the imagination. He has some very choice thoughts about the Catholic Church and, and what the Catholic Church has has done, particularly through uh, sort of the, the 
the effeminization of people through religion and through theology. Uh, he doesn't think all religion does this, but he certainly thinks that uh, the Roman Catholic Church has done it, uh, mainly as a means of retaining political power. It's not an allegory against the Catholic Church, though. There, again, there are many levels to the work, and Machiavelli is, if he's, that's not really how allegorical writing would have worked during that time anyhow. So he certainly is saying that people need to change the way that they're ruling. And, you know, the, the Catholic Church, if they want to truly help Italy, they need to change their tactics. But no, it's not all bashing the Catholic Church. Was the prince uh, directed at Lorenzo de Michi, Medici, excuse me, and was it a how-to manual to get into his good graces more than anything else? Because it was dedicated to him by some translations, and I know that's controversial mm -hmm. in and of itself, but mm -hmm. you can pick it up however you want to from there. Uh, so it was, you know, there is the dedication, and it certainly was trying to get back into politics. Is was, was Machiavelli trying to get back into political power. I think that's absolutely true. Um, but I'm not sure if I would say it's that above all else. Um, Again, Machiavelli definitely wanted this, and this was one of the intentions of, of the work, but it's doing a lot of other things as well. Quite frankly, if Machiavelli had just wanted to write something that was going to get him hired, he would have written something that was a lot more flattering to the Medici family. He comes out at several points in the work and says things that are, uh, that are critical of certain tactics that the Medici have used, and this is pretty open right and like when when he when he lauds various enemies of the medici that's that's pretty open so if he were just trying to get a job and start working for the medici family uh he'd probably be a little bit more uh a little bit more um you know flattering toward them um another one of these that comes up when you do a little bit of research on this who was the audience? Um, was it the ruling class or was it for the common people trying to explain the ruling class? It's a really great question. Machiavelli, again, says he's writing, his intention is to write something useful for whoever understands it. And I don't think Machiavelli is thinking, let me write this for the ruling class or let me write this for people, and, you know, and, and people could read. There's literacy, I think, is, is more widespread than we give people credit for at that time, at that place, in that context. Uh, women could, could read and, and write, uh, many of them as well, not, not all, obviously. But um, so Machiavelli is writing for whoever is going to read this. And I, he, he really does have an eye toward future generations. This is not something that is particularly rare. There's, there's this, they're picking up his, he and his contemporaries are picking up on this long tradition of earlier writers as well. Seneca, for instance, writing for people hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in the future, self-consciously so. And Machiavelli is doing that as well. He's, he, you can even say he's writing for us. He doesn't know exactly what it's going to look like, uh, you know, in 2022, but he's writing for future generations. He's writing for people uh, in that time. He's writing for everyone. And I don't think he's writing it for one class or another. He has advice clearly for both of them. And he has criticisms of, of, of all classes as well. Here's one. We'll get into this a little more because we're going to bring this up to the American uh, political system at, towards the end of our conversation. But I want to go ahead and tease it now, though. Is it making an argument for republicanism? And now this isn't republicanism as we understand it in America. This is from the Greek tradition out of the discourses, that sort of thing. It is mentioned. Is it an argument for republicanism? This kind of goes back again to, you know, is it or isn't it anti-Catholic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's definitely more and it, it's it's. It's so weird because we always try to to retrofit contemporary concepts onto earlier thinkers. Um, there's the Republican tradition is very nascent in Machiavelli's time, and as you mentioned, it doesn't really mean exactly what we think of it as meaning today. It is certainly a pro-Republican small R text in the sense that it is more oriented toward 
individualism. It really is an individualistic work. Machiavelli is an individualistic thinker. He's not an elitist, although he understands that there will, you know, that there are political elites. He kind of sees that or wants to construct that as more of a merit-based political elite system, uh, not one that is that is codified or institutionalized by class or what have you. Um, and that's something that you'll have scholars arguing back and forth about. There are a lot of people who disagree on that. Um, is it, it's definitely more pro-popular rule than something like a monarchy. Machiavelli is part of a more small, a Republican, almost proto-liberal tradition. But again, I don't like to retrofit terms. Machiavelli is clearly working with some concepts that today we would identify as being early liberal, early Republican. Uh, he is a fan of, of more popular rule. He is an individualistic thinker. Absolutely. All right. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, Russo's on. Uh, oh. He actually called it a satire. I thought this might come up. <laughs> I, I, I find this one. kind. Of, this is kind of one of my favorite ones. This is like when you're discussing, you know, Bible textology and somebody's like, well, the whole thing's allegory. It's like, I'm, that's not really helping your argument. That almost makes it worse. So is the whole thing a, just a giant satire? Short answer, no. Medium answer, heck no. Um, so <laughs> longer, longer answer. Um, that's again, that's not really how satire would have been done anyhow during that time. Uh, we we think, you know, there's this hipsterification of early thinkers that we like to do. Oh, so and so is just being ironic. They were just they were just trying. They were just making fun. That. The, that tradition was was not really a literary tradition, first of all, in the same way back then. Now, Machiavelli certainly plays with irony. He certainly plays with dark humor. Um, but he's the prince is not a satire. He's not when he does satirize. It's usually through his plays. He's a great playwright. He's got some fun stuff. Um, it's it's not the there is a continuity of thought. In fact between all of Machiavelli's major works, and indeed with his letters, his, his letters to his friends, that if you if the prince is a satire, then everything that Machiavelli ever wrote was a satire, including his personal letters, because there's a continuity of thought and intention and motive between the prince and the discourses and even the art of war. And again, private letters, poems, uh, I can't see it being a satire and certainly not in the way that we think of satire today. All right. And this one, I can't wait to watch your reaction on this one. Is, oh, no. There's been a few people because there's uh -huh. always those guys, right? But because the discourses, which is a technical term is the discourses on the first 10 books of Titus Levius, which was, you know, that's the classical way that you would deal with the subject, but he went way afield of the subject and got mm -hmm. Uh, ranty, I think is a fair way to say it. Um, Times, yeah. But because it was more of, it went very different in voice and key. It went more into the Republican system we were talking about. There is the argument, these were written by two different guys. What would you <laughs> say to that? Yeah, I mean, no. Uh, that's, that's, again, because of the continuity of thought, uh, that's, that's highly unlikely. I mean, I, it's, it's not even, I, it's not, that's, it's not true. Um, it was not written by, they were not written by two different guys. There is too much evidence that it was not in every single way. But when you look at the two texts, the prince is about politics ex novo, right? It's politics from the ground up, from a zero degree state. Well, the discourses is about maintaining and perpetuating the state. Machiavelli is very interested in the discourses with perpetuity, renewal. Uh, we may or may not get into some of that later. Um, so these are about two different dimensions of governance, if you like, but they are the same guy with the same beliefs talking about the ex novo and then talking about the, again, the perpetuity and the, the renewal of foundation. Which makes sense when you think about it, because again, that's the classical way you did a treatise was you take something like, okay, I'm going to dig deep onto this subject. You know, we, mm -hmm. 
you know, it'd be like doing a doctorate paper now for lack right. of a better term as a comparison. So of course it's going to be different, but I did, I did find it funny. There's folks out there like that. We're talking to Amanda Griffiths. Okay. We're going to dig into some of those influences. We're going to start getting into the modern age, you know, 15th century, still a long time ago. How did it, how does this thing endure? And then we're going to get to even how the American founding fathers uh, talked about Machiavelli and a lot of world history, big time names, good and bad had a lot of stuff, uh, one major figure in modern history for the bad team, the bad side, if you will, actually had his own annotated copy. We'll talk about that. Amanda Griffiths continues with us talking Machiavelli in a very non-Machiavelli way because we're trying to do it in plain language that even I can understand because she's just that brilliant. More with her right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. We're having fun with this one, but we're going to get it up to why it's important to us even today. Machiavelli, the man, the myth, the legend, the original conspiracy theories and politics, if you will, in a lot of ways. Um, so we have a gap of time here where the legend grew. We already talk about how it got into the English language, basically in the reverse way of like, hey, this guy's terrible. And everybody went, well, wait a minute, maybe we should read the source material. And it kind of took off from there. After that, though, because you have a lot of history going on, what made this thing endure so much? Because, you know, there was other it, in and of itself, it probably wasn't that unique of a writing for the time period. Although, you know, composition wise, it's, you know, it's tight, it's readable, that sort of thing. The one liners, if you will, in it, that sort of stuff. Why did it endure, do you think, up until the modern time? Uh, I think, again, we've talked about, you know, who who was the audience, the prince? And we keep coming back to the fact that The Prince was written for a very wide audience, and it was written for an audience beyond just Machiavelli's contemporaries. When you have a work like that, and when you have a work like that that's done well, it does resonate with a, a really significant and, and long stretch of people uh, across cultures, across time frames. So I think that's why. I think there's something that resonates there's there's a truth i'm getting i'm putting myself in, in jeopardy here uh there, there there's this kind of enduring truth that some that that at least speaks to people or seems to be present in in the prince and in the discourses and machiavelli's work we argue about what that is but there seems to be something that across cultures across time is true and is present in the text and that draws us to it uh, i think that's so much of why we keep coming back to it we keep coming back to certain works like it uh that it it, it seems to sustain us and it seems to have something to say to us regardless of historical context um, that we can use <sighs> Because you're talking about historical context, this is a wider topic, but I just take a slice of it because you could talk about this part of it a little day. Mythology and myth-making and things like Machiavelliism, for lack of a better way to explain it, this is an important part of history because this is how stuff like political philosophy, like you know, lost history, this has always been a big part of human history. The word of mouth tradition, mm -hmm. the legends, the myth making, the you know, the marbleization of men, as we've called it in America, where you know you talk about a dead figure and it's like somewhere in that statue is the truth, but everybody just knows the statue. That really is important, even when it's wrong, even when it's got the conspiracy theories and all that. It's still an important part of how we do history, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, it's, it's something that I think is, you know, I, that, that is what kind of brings us back to certain thinkers. And it's something that I think Machiavelli would approve of it. I think, you know, if, if you were to, to say, well, people will read your work. And part of that, though, uh, involves a bunch of rumors and myths getting passed down about you that may or may not be true, but people will continue to find your work again and again and again and find meaning from it as a result. Uh, I think that's something that Machiavelli and certainly a Machiavellian thinker 
would would support in the long run if you have something to say and if you have something important to say then you know however it takes getting it out there um you're you know maybe we're going back a little bit to to the ends justifying the means which end well both um so yeah i think that certainly is part of it that is that is certainly a, a tactic of 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 fate and of history or as uh, my father would say if you get the ends justifying the means and they're pulling on both ends you know the truth ends up being the rope um, <laughs> i like that a lot i dig he's, that he's full of that kind of stuff yeah. you know taught high school for 35 like years he's got a lot of one-liners um let's get to the nitty-gritty there of how we as americans in the year of our lord 2022 are still talking about machiavelli and you've even got merchandise with machiavelli on it we already talked about how this got into the English-speaking realm and in the English-speaking academic tradition through France to England. Well, when you look at our founding fathers, what was their influences? France and England. Mm -hmm. So naturally, they knew about this. You look into history, it's really interesting. Um, Franklin, Madison, Jefferson, they all have writings mentioning Machiavelli. We have kind of a strong stream here. They're, one of the balls of thread on this thing, you pulled the yarn enough, American founding fathers, they liked them some Machiavelli, both the theories of it and the mythology of it, but some of them actually read his work and treated it seriously too, didn't they? They did. And this is something about which I'm sure I'm sure you've you've done quite a bit of reading. Um, even people like Addison and Hume, who are probably more frequently invoked in some of the founding fathers' writings, they're reading Machiavelli, uh, they're drawing from him. Uh, George Washington, in fact, was was a very strategic and kind of cagey thinker and modeled some of his strategies after um, <clears throat> after some of the mythology around uh, was it Cincinnati? So uh, and and obviously Livy talks about him. Machiavelli uh, admires a lot of the strategies that Cincinnati uses to become this mythologized figure. So yeah, um, there is quite a bit. Of, of Machiavelli that leaks into our own institutions. And I do say institutions, right? Uh, in the constitution that we have today, the mixed government that we have, it's not only Machiavelli who gives us this, obviously, a uh, fellow named Polybius comes up with these mixed, mixed regimes, but in the uh, first book of the discourses in the early chapters, Machiavelli lays out a lot, you know, what looks sort of like an early, bicameral type of system and it's a little bit of a riffing on what the romans had machiavelli gives us ideas for institutions not just in the discourses by the way but in some of the shorter writings as well and some of his briefer writings um where he talks about having divided government um and where he talks about having various he doesn't use this term specifically but what we today would call checks and balances uh and Yes, it certainly has had an influence on our founding fathers today. I would say, and this is something that I would like to go into more in my own research, um, there's, you can even derive some early market theory from a lot of what Machiavelli has to say about the, uh, you know, the pursuit of merit and the reward of excellence and uh, the, the freedom or the leaving it to a republic citizens to make experiment of their virtue and the power of fortune in private as well as public. I think that is such a great encapsulation of what liberty should look like. Um, and we get that from Machiavelli. Um, that's what Machiavelli tells us should, should happen in a republic. Um, experiments of virtue and experiments of fortune. And so, yeah, you, you get a lot of this really good stuff from him. And it, it redounds into the present. One of the real interesting ones, um, one of the important parts that defined our government, of course, and long before they made a musical about him, was what Hamilton was doing with the Federalist Party. Um, there was a concern about a, ra a rising aristocracy. That was a big deal to folks. Um, and that's where some of the stuff, his views on republicanism, his views on citizen soldiers, which really, you know, that's how the founding fathers saw themselves. So that that fit like a glove when they read stuff like that. And not that he was the first one to put it. It's just, he's the popular work. So it makes sense. Um, you talk about Washington and Cincinnati. 
to his credit, Washington is probably the closest thing to Cincinnati we have in American history because yeah. he took over the army. He could have been king. And no, I'm going back to my farm, which, you know, full disclosure, he was the richest man in America by a lot. So that wasn't exactly, you know, he wasn't taking a vow of poverty or anything, but still he laid down power and went back to his farm. Those those threads all go together to make this great, big, hot American mess that we love so much. But it was John Adams is the one that's really got into Machiavelli. He wrote extensively about Machiavelli and he he wrote so much about it. He actually wrote about what other people wrote about it. So he wrote about what Sidney and Montesquieu and these other guys were writing about Machiavelli. So he was really getting into it. And that's where you start really seeing um, not so much the political philosophy, but the core philosophy of Machiavelli, which is what the Catholic Church probably objected to, because the Catholic Church, I don't want to get too theological here, but you've got to you got to deal with this because it's important. The Catholic Church was we are what redeems men and Machiavelli's core principle and what John Adams latched on was no human nature is undefeated and driven by passion. And it's always going to be bad unless you put guardrails on it. And when you get through all the myth and all that, that's kind of the question that they're dealing with, isn't it? Well, that's certainly Adams. Yeah. And I think Machiavelli doesn't really, he certainly talks about men and, he, and, and, and what we today call human nature. Um, and I think what Machiavelli would say is that, you know, men re- that, and, and maybe here, here I'll go right back to Homer. <laughs> Salvation's light is in our We cannot answer. get away from the Greeks in this conversation. Right. No, we We're can. trying to stay away from the Greeks. It's we all Greek well, to me. I mean, yeah, no, Ajax is my Hellenic crush. So, I mean, I stand. But, uh, so, yeah, salvation's light is in our is in our hands work. And I think Machiavelli would, would agree with that as well. You know, Machiavelli is perhaps, yeah, he's got a cynical, he's absolutely got cynicism to him. But there's also, I think if you're going to write what Machiavelli writes, and if you're going to want to be involved in politics at all, you do have to have some degree of some weird kind of optimism within that cynicism, or that idealism, I should say, within the, that cynicism. And for Machiavelli, I don't think he sees men as inherently fallen, because I don't. he doesn't understand anything as inherently good or bad. So in order to see someone as fallen, you would have to understand someone as inherently bad or as there being some kind of inherent thing like evil. For Machiavelli, it's very much what we do with what is given to us. And Adams, I think you're absolutely correct, is is looking at this uh, for him through a more, you know, if, if you're if you're reading religion into it, Adams is looking at this through more of a, no, people, people need guardrails because people are wicked and fallen. Machiavelli does say that men are sadly wicked, but that is more of, of a commentary on the way that things are. It's not a commentary, I think, on, on essence so much. It's not a commentary on some fixed state. Machiavelli is all about how people are fluid and everything is always in flux. I think what Machiavelli wants to do is he wants to use that that fact of things always being in flux, of nothing being inherently good or evil, and say, let's work with what is, let's work with what's given to us, by contingency, by this, you know, by this basket of externalities that we see as being external to us and use it toward our purpose. And then that in and of itself is a kind of redemption. And you see that in the way that Machiavelli talks about the necessity of tumults and people fighting with one another and there being political strife and struggle. It's in that collision of multiple forces and multiple intentions and and multiple desires that actually produces great, amazing things and keeps on creating and perpetuates the life of the Republic. It's, It's born and born again and renews itself through this collision and through this, you know, through, uh, through the, you know, the cacophony of all things. So again, that that's a little bit more metaphysical, but I think you that's that plays into what we see today in our own systems and our own institutions of having parties duking it out, of having people with 
different political views, you know, of having discourse, of having, uh, you know, of having open speech and things like that. So we get some of these ideas, maybe not directly from Machiavelli, but you certainly find them supported in what Machiavelli says. And we, we glossed over it a little bit, but I think we need to mention it here. And it's a good way to wrap up this founding father part is, you know, he spoke about things being cyclical and growth and decay. So I know you're talking the metaphysical, but just on the practical level, the Machiavelli text was like, look, there's a cycle to things. It grows, it decays. You can see why the Catholic Church hated it, because their thing is like, we are eternal, we are unchanging, which, you know, they change all the time. But you can see the thing there. And then so for somebody like an Adams gets a hold of it, and they go like, oh, this is why we need to have a system of government and later on the Constitution where you can amendment and you can change it and the people can continue to work on it. So even going back, you know, we're talking, what, three, four hundred years of history now spanning between those two guys. You can start seeing how those threads line up, can't you? You can. And it's it's really interesting, right, because you have multiple ways of viewing history. You have that kind of fixedness, as you mentioned then you have this linearity. And then you have this understanding of cyclicality. Now Machiavelli, I think he comes closest to cyclicality, but I would refer to Machiavelli's view of history and time as voluted, which is spiral shaped, which is certainly cyclical, but you're never exactly in the same place twice. Um, you return. And again, this is this has to do with a, um, there is a tradition of thought that Machiavelli is drawing from here uh, on, on his, um, in his own time and in his own context, this idea of there being a, a returning throughout time to various points and various trends. But in that process of returning, you're taking the essence of something and you are renewing it. You're drawing out on this thread, let's say the foundation of a republic, let's say the foundation of a state. You, there is a time to redraw on the foundation, not to rupture the foundation, not to break from the foundation. That would, that would be the view of, of history as entirely progressive and entirely linear. But to take the root of the foundation, the spirit of the foundation, draw it back out and allow it to emerge in a new way. And I think a perfect example of how that happens is with constitutional amendments is with, uh, honestly, with, with judicial review and with, with uh, Supreme Court rulings, like interpreting the Constitution, you return to the foundations of something and you allow those foundations to manifest themselves, the spirit of that foundation to manifest itself in a new way. So Machiavelli is all about this kind of voluted time um, and this, this spiral-shaped process of return and renewal. Yeah, it's amazing. All right. We're going to take another quick break. We come back. We're going to have some fun. Pop culture, famous names, a little bit more myth or truth. We're going to ask her some more questions, put her on the spot. Amanda Griffiths joining us. We're going to wrap up this Machiavelli talk. This has been a blast. I'm looking forward to this little pop culture. Always fun to bring into. That's a pretty good legacy for a guy from 500 years ago that he's in pop culture today. More oh. Machiavelli with Amanda Griffiths right after this. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. We're talking Machiavelli, the man, the myth, the legend, the conspiracy theories, the pop culture. Machiavelli's a pop culture icon. How did that happen? It's so good. I, I mean, I asked the girl I, that's wearing the shirt with Machiavelli <laughs> merchandise. So, you know, that's right. And I think he would approve. You yeah, know, I said, I think I've got three Machiavelli shirts at least. 
Um, how does he become a pop culture icon? How doesn't he really? Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of Tupac, right? I mean, Tupac kind of popularized Machiavelli. I think, again, you've got these artists, you've got people from all walks of life who are reading this guy, who are finding him to be, to have something to say to them, not just with respect to politics, but with respect to, with respect to life, with respect to living, with respect to relationships. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I think there's something, again, that's mysterious about him. The mystique itself is kind of sexy. Um, and, and that, that endures, that resonates not just through history, but through various avenues of, of, of life. Now, in another strain, before we get into some of the pop culture stuff, Machiavelli has been very popular with the revolutionary crowd. Now, it doesn't seem like communism and revolutions and things would be a perfect fit if you actually read Machiavelli. But I can kind of get, you know, Parsa. Uh, turns out Joseph Stalin actually had his own annotated copy. He read it so many times, made so many notes in it. Is Machiavelli and communism a natural fit, or are they doing a square peg in a round hole? We'll unpack that for us a little bit, because, you know, this, this is your God. You know, you might have to defend him a little bit here. Oh, uh, I know. I get, the blunt, I get the blunt force. I get the use of force. I get the political leanings. Is that really a natural fit, though? So funny story about uh, about the copy of of of, um, of Machiavelli. When I first heard that from a professor um, back in undergrad, I kind of snappily said, "Oh, it's a shame he never actually read it." Um, but shame, shame he never actually read the print. But of course, yeah, he did. So there's there's something that we were talking before the break about different philosophies of history, right? And I said there's a sort of a static philosophy of history. There's a linear progressive philosophy of history. There is a cyclical philosophy of history. And then there's what Machiavelli is doing, which is kind of a voluted spiral shaped philosophy of history where nothing is ever destroyed. There is absolutely chaos and there is absolutely tumult. Tumult is necessary. There are forces colliding, but there's never a destruction. And when people read Machiavelli, people like Hegel, people like Marx, um, there is a tendency to read in the more Marxian Hegelian philosophy of history, which is linear and progressive, where they look at Machiavelli talking about the necessity for struggle and the necessity for collision of multiple forces. And they read deep class theory into this. And they say, yes, exactly. So what Machiavelli is saying is he's saying that there needs to be colliding classes. And then after this, you know, after this Sturm und Drang of the classes, then there's a new thing that's created that is radically different from the old. And you probably can't tell in, in the background. I have, I, I'm a huge fan of, I studied the Russian revolution as well. I've got darkness of in people's tragedy right there. Like, He's this, Machiavelli is definitely this figure uh, for, for the Russian Revolution, but a lot of this comes from viewing history as progressive and reading that progressive linear philosophy of history into Machiavelli, whereas for Machiavelli, there is no essential difference. So the key thing for Hegel, and we won't get too much into the weeds in this, I know, but the key thing for Hegel and Marx and, and people of, of their ilk is that you only know something through what it is not. So there's this concept of essential difference that there is there is a something and then there is an, a nothing, a, an opposite of there being something. And with Machiavelli, there's this understanding of there being essential distinction, but not difference. And when you have that, when you have change and creation occurring because various, you know, various aspects of reality are distilled and taken apart and then assembled in different ways. You can have something that is both new and enduring. So you have a misread of Machiavelli's philosophy of history that I think takes you into this understanding of Machiavelli as being more Hegelian, more Marxian. Uh, which is not correct, although he certainly is revolutionary in the true sense and that he believes in renewal. But for him, renewal is always change with a memory. It's never total destruction. 
it's it's a type of change that draws from ancient roots over and over and over again. That's Machiavelli's project. Yeah. So looking at it, as far as pop culture goes, um, again, you know, we're talking about the 15th century here. He was already showing up in plays as early as 1589. There was a Marlowe play where he yes. played kind of a uh, Seneca ghost, which is, you know, appropriate enough, but everybody knew it was Machiavelli. That's pretty impressive in that day and age to have that kind of notoriety that you start showing up in plays, which would have been the movies of our time. This is yeah. kind of a big deal. You know, you're only, what, 50 years after his death and he's already showing up in plays. That, so we've got 500 years of him being a pop culture icon. That's pretty impressive historically, isn't it? It's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like that if, if I could, you know, if I could be a pop culture icon for, you know, for 500 years or more. Um, no, he's got a good record. And I think he continues to be relevant because once again, we continue to, to find mystery in him and we continue to, to argue about him and fight about him. Uh, and I think that's part of, that's that's necessary as Machiavelli says tumults are necessary I think the fact that we can't figure Machiavelli out is part of what keeps him relevant and allows us to continue to draw wisdom and truth from him yeah it's fascinating okay let me put you on the spot there's been plenty of um cultural references to him portrayals tv series movies he's usually a bit player sometimes he's the main character What's one of your favorites oh, out of the movies and TVs that really that you think maybe not even was accurate, but just kind of got because, you know, these historical figures, you're never going to be historically accurate. That's kind of chasing the needle, but they got the essence of it or you like that take on it. Because, again, this is a multifaceted guy that you can take a couple different ways. What's one or two that kind of jumped out at you? That's that's I'm such a bad person to answer this question because I'm sure there are a lot of pop pop cultural references that I don't even know because I'm an academic and I just live in a live in a little hole. Um, I mean, I I I dig Tupac. Like I, I I like those references. I'm not sure if that counts. If that counts as a portrayal. Counts with um, me. I was okay. in high school when East Coast West Coast <laughs> went down, so I I know. Like I bought that album. I had that on CD. Um, it, for, okay. For folks that don't know, let's, let's do lowest level real quick. Tupac Shakur had to go to prison because of, um, sexual assault of all things. So he goes to prison. He reads Machiavelli while he's in prison, gets greatly influenced in his work. He comes out of prison and he has that epic 14, 15 month run with the death row records before he's shot and killed. That's the bulk of his career is that real short window. But when he was in prison before he came out, a lot of what his music after that was influenced by Machiavelli. And the last album he put out was called, he actually changed his name to Machiavelli, M-A-K-A mm -hmm. Belly. And he put out an album, Machiavelli, The Seven Day Theory. It's one of my favorite Tupac records. And then, of course, he died before it came out. So it came out posthumously. And that just fueled even more. Now we got another conspiracy theory with Tupac. We'll skip all that for right now. But that's pretty amazing, really, when you think about it, isn't it? But yeah, that's that's one of the way first things out of uh, outside of having a history teacher for a father that's one of the first real ways i was like oh tupac's in the machiavelli i better i should read that that's pretty cool right that's that was big doings for a west virginia kid if tupac's into it right yeah no i mean honestly i that that i can't say that was my entry to machiavelli but it was it it's it's pretty rad to know that he's he's influenced this this artist in this way and you know tupac belongs to a long tradition of people who read machiavelli in prison so more power to him and you could tell he read it, by the way, because he, he, he's got some very specific stuff oh, in there. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, here's one, because this one also plays into one of those, uh, you know, was he accurately quoted thing. Uh, the movie The Bronx Tale, 93, you know, Chaz Palmieri, De Niro's in it, great film. But they have that great scene where they're like, uh, the, old, the old mobster's telling the young mobster, you know, hey, this famous writer from 500 years ago, and he busts out the line, so... You tell us whether this is accurate or not okay. because it's been attributed. Yeah. Is if you can't be loved or and feared, it's better to be feared than loved. And they attribute it, and it's in the movie. It's a great movie, by the way. Everybody should go watch it. I'm sure it's on streaming. Did Machiavelli actually say that, or is it a lot like uh, the other uh, quotations that are somewhat, if you get to it, he kind of said it, but just not the way we get it in English? It's more true, but still not quite. So Machiavelli says, first of all, uh, he says you should be both, that you should try to be both loved and feared. 
And then he says, if you can only be one, it's safer to be feared uh, than compared to love. So it's safer. Um, and that, I think that changes a lot. He does not, he's not putting a normative value on it. He's not saying it's better to be feared. Uh, but fear and love, if you think about things that you love, there, there's always a fear that comes with it. There's a fear that comes with losing it. There's a fear of losing something. Um, if you think about things that you're worried about, there's, it's because there's a passion that underlies it. There's something that's deep and meaningful to you. And so I think fear and love are already closer together than we give them credit for. But yeah, so what Machiavelli says is you should really try to be both. He goes on and on and on and says, you got to be both. And in fact, don't be hated. Then he follows it up with, you can't be hated. Never be hated. So definitely try to be both feared and loved. Never be hated. If you have to pick one, it's safer to be feared compared to love. So that's how it goes. Yeah. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, let's talk about Dallas, the TV soap opera. When they brought it back for its remix back in uh, 2013, J.R. Ewing, of course, the legendary, uh, one of the greatest plot lines in all of TV history, who shot J.R. Everybody remembers that one. Um, in the remake, though, he gives his personal annotated copy of The Prince. This is in the, the storyline of the show, of course, to his adopted nephew and tells him, and I'm going to quote here because he says, and Machiavelli said this, and you tell us, Use it because being smart and sneaky is an unbeatable combination. Now, clearly, that's not a direct quote. Yeah, I don't think that's verbatim. That's not verbatim, but that's how a lot of people treat Machiavelli. Again, they, that's how the viewpoint is. That's pretty much how folks think about it. How accurate is it? That's pretty accurate. I think that's that's good. I mean, again, it's, that's never. I have never read anything that I could even reasonably say that is the specific quote to what she is referring about being smart and sneaky being a useful combination. Um, the closest thing I can think of is when Machiavelli says that it, you know it's it's wise to simulate foolishness at the at the proper time, and that's in reference to Lucius Unius Brutus. Um, it's uh, in, in the discourses, but. Basically, yeah, that that it's, and again, very close together. Being smart and being sneaky, I think it, it goes back to to the quote on my shirt a little bit. Being a being a bit of a fox. Um, so yeah, I would say I, I don't, I don't mind that. I don't mind that reference. Um, there's plenty of others we could go down a long list, but we already talked about both Borges series, which were very different. Um, I recommend the Canal Overseas one. Uh, of course, the Tudors, he appears in that. Yeah. When you start crossing paths with the real heavyweights of histories, like, you know, Henry VIII, like the Borgias, how is it, do you think, that Machiavelli still holds up? Because he's just one guy. Those are dynasties, for lack of a better way of saying it. You know, those are real world history players. And Machiavelli's name is intricately entwined in him. Yeah. Well, Machiavelli's got dynasty. He's, he's got a dynasty, doesn't he? He has a, a dynasty of, of Machiavelli. <laughs> Uh, scholars and, and aficionados, and some of them, as we were saying, some of them are great names. Some of them are uh, are great names in other ways, but perhaps not uh, virtuous names. Um, so, how does he hold up? I think I think Machiavelli holds up pretty well. Uh, and again, there's a lot that could be said about about the Borgias and some of the mythology around them as well. Um, but yeah, I think when he starts to wind his way into all of these other legacies, that definitely says something and it speaks to the man's value. And great thing about Machiavelli not having a, a I, I mean, he had a family, had, you know, but having more of an intellectual dynasty is we can all be part of the Machiavelli dynasty, uh, you know, as if we choose to, to read him and learn from him, so. Okay, we saved the ultimate Machiavelli myth for last. Uh -oh. And we'll close on this with Amanda Griffiths because this has been a blast. We're going to have you back. We're going to do more history stuff with you because this is fun. Did Machiavelli start the Illuminati? <laughs> I don't think so. I, give I two examples. You're an academic. You know how this works. 
I give, give examples of how he didn't start the, the Illuminati. Um, I don't know if I could do that, but uh, I, I do not believe that, no, no, Machiavelli didn't start the Illuminati. Again, so Machiavelli, if he were going to, he's not as much of an intellect. Everyone thinks that Machiavelli is like writing some super, super secret text, right? In a lot of ways, he has to be underhanded. He is. But Machiavelli wants you to figure out what he's saying. He's not trying to hide something from you. He's trying to make sure that you see what, like you're picking up what he's putting down. And in a lot of ways, the process of looking into a text and trying to figure out what is being said reveals what is being said. So for Machiavelli, he wants that revelation for everyone. Machiavelli is not a secret society type of dude for the sake of having a secret society. I think that's one of the biggest reasons that I would say, you know, Machiavelli is probably not, you know, trying to start closed off elitist circles. He wants to have knowledge available to people who seek it out and that is that re that redounds through his writing that redounds through what he believes about politics uh that's what you know what he believes about again governance and discourse so i wouldn't really call him an illuminati type of guy but he certainly does have an interesting way of getting you to try and figure out what he's saying all right. So you're getting all those nice fancy letters after your name by studying all this for us common folk uh, from Summersville, West Virginia. If we want to read more about it, because there's a lot of junk out there about this. There's a lot of myths. What's a couple really good sources if folks want to read up further on this topic for themselves, which we encourage you to do and we'll link to it. Please do. And I know and I'll, I'll recommend people just Machiavelli scholars love to fight. So I'm going to I'm going to recommend people and like you can. I, I don't agree with everything that all of these people say all the time. Um, d read the actual works themselves, okay? Read the prints, read the discourses. The discourses is so good. Um, he is Machiavelli and his friends, their personal correspondence has letters that Machiavelli published, um, or not, wow, well, not published, Machiavelli wrote uh, back and forth to his friends. So that's Machiavelli and his friends, uh, their personal correspondence that gives you the letters. One of my favorite translations of the Prince is it, it would it would be the the Mansfield version, Mansfield and Tarkov's discourses. Uh, my advisor at the University of Chicago is named John McCormick, and he wrote a number. He writes books about uh, about Machiavelli that are readily available for public consumption. He's always churning out articles. I don't always agree with him, but I agree with him quite a bit, and he has a lot of amazing things to say about Machiavelli. So any you know anything that you find on uh, by John McCormick is going to be very interesting and enlightening for you on Machiavelli. Uh, those are great places to start, I think. But definitely start with the man himself, the man, the myth, the legend, the dude, Machiavelli. Yeah, and a little academic tip for people that haven't done academics: a lot of academic writing. If you're uh, like to do things on the cheap, like I do, a lot of academic writing is actually available in PDF format. You can get it that That's way. Nice and uh, bypass stuff and almost everybody's phone has a pdf reader and you can get it that way it's a real good quick easy way to get academic stuff because if you're like me and you have problems with big words control f is your friend and you can skip around and get just to the machiavelli parts you want to read and so on and so forth i love pdf academic uh, yeah. scholarship it makes uh people like me look way smarter than i really am because i can just take quick it's basically uh interactive cliff notes don't tell any of my teachers I said that. Uh, Amanda Griffith, this has been great. Let folks know where they can follow you and keep up with you until we get you back on again. Uh, you can follow me. I said my, my Hellenic crush was Ajax the Great, and so my Twitter handle is at Ajax the Griff. So A-J-A-X-T-H-E-G-R-I-F-F. -F. Uh, and that's where you can find me on, on, on the Twitters. Um, and I'm also a contributor at Young Voices, so I write for them. Uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's where I am right now. We might have to do some communist theory next time since we got the oh, books please. back there and everything. We'll get you back. Please. Yes. So <laughs> we're going to put you in the rotation. This was yeah. fantastic. Thank you so much for doing this. Machiavelli getting a little bit of the noise turned down. I don't know if you can ever get to the whole truth, 
I think we got a little closer to it than just, you know, J.R. Ewing and Tupac, though. So not too bad. How do we do? Fantastic. I real I this was such a blast. So thank you so much, Andrew. I, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to coming back and uh, yeah, great questions. We'll do it again soon. Thank you so much, right. my friend. Take care. Thank you. You too. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Take control of your growing company's finances with Bill Spend and Expense, the free-to-use spend management software powered by the Bill Divi Corporate Card. With credit lines from $50,000 to $5 million, Bill Spend and Expense is here to help you thrive. Say goodbye to manual expense reports and juggling multiple cards. And say hello to saving time and eliminating wasteful spend. Try Bill Spend and Expense today at bill.com slash promo 500 and get $500. Terms and conditions apply. Advertised credit ranges are not guaranteed and are determined at approval. Card issued by Cross River Bank. Member FDIC. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.